Uh, the first one, uh, it's, uh, as you can see on the screen, catch more bass. Uh, Mike Miller has, a passion, has had a passion for fishing since he was five years old. As soon as he finished college, he spent time working as a walleye, pike, and trout guide with a lodge in northwestern Ontario. At the age of 21, Mike won his first competitive bass fishing event and has since become one of Canada's most successful professional bass anglers with 26 tournament wins, multiple Angler of the Year and Team of the Year awards, and 18 big bass titles. It's evident that Mike can catch fish, and in 2004, he became the host and co-producer of the popular Fishing Canada show, where he honed his on-air skills and had the opportunity to travel across Canada to experience the fantastic fishing opportunities we enjoy. In 2011, we were fortunate to have Mike join the OFH as host and executive producer of the award-winning Angler and Hunter television show. He launched the show's 19th season, and ever since, he's been able to share his wealth of knowledge and in the field experience to help anglers understand what it takes to catch more and bigger fish. So please join me in welcoming Mike Miller. Oh, thank you. That's quite an introduction. I usually have to introduce myself every weekday, weekend morning on the, uh, the television and share my thoughts and uh, things of what I'm gonna do uh, on the television program, but uh, it's, it's true. Um, my background is, is fishing, and most people, when I, when I first uh, joined the organization and got involved with the TV show was, oh, we didn't know you hunted, but um, to me, I mean, I've, I've hunted since I was uh, old enough to, um, and I've obviously fished uh, since I was a little guy, but uh, to me, they both go hand in hand. Fishing and hunting are, uh, are kind of, uh, they, they do go hand in hand, and especially with uh, uh, some of the credentials I've uh, attained over the years with, with bass fishing. Um, I'm kind of a unique individual when it comes to, to fishing. I'm sure there's a few people in the room that have been out in the boat with me. And uh, I sort of have a dogged determination to make things work in my favor and not the fish's favor when I'm out there. And, uh, and one of those things is uh, I've kind of, I've got an addiction for catching big bass. And, and um, Greg mentioned that uh, I have 18 big bass titles. A big bass title is um, in tournament fishing. If you go out for a two-day or a three-day or a one-day tournament, to, you know, doesn't matter where you are, they usually have a, a, a secondary prize, as not just first place or second place or third place, but they have the big fish of the weekend or the tournament. And uh, I've, had to, I've uh, managed to win that 18 times, and, and that's usually a fish that's uh, you know, there's probably, you know, let's say there's 150 guys in a tournament, so there's probably three or 4,000 fish caught in a weekend, and that's usually the biggest fish of the weekend. And to, to get the big fish of a bass tournament, it's got to usually be over five pounds. How many people in here have caught, honestly caught a five-pound bass? Everybody? Lots of hands, right? Five-pound bass is it's a big bass, and I think the Canadian record's uh, just over 10 pounds, and it was caught back when I was three or four years, I don't know, little guy. In a, in a pond not far from here off, the, off of uh, <laughs> Woodbine Avenue. And uh, whether or not it was a legitimate 10 and a half pounder, nobody really knows. It was so long ago. But since then, I don't think there's ever been a bass weighed on a scale that um, crested 10 pounds. So a five pound ba uh, bass is pretty big. And, um, you know, I've had the privilege of catching many, many five pound bass. But uh, most of those big bass titles were fish, you know, pushing uh, upwards of seven pounds. So, to go out in a tournament and, and compete with uh, professional bass anglers and come in with, with some big fish on a um, regular basis, it takes more than just luck. And this is kind of what I'm going to talk about because I think um, everybody, you know, has, whether you're musky fishing or walleye fishing or pike, it doesn't matter what you're fishing for, everybody likes to catch big fish, am I right? You know, it's, it's one thing to catch some walleye to eat or a, or a, or a nice brook trout to eat, but if you're out there, um, you know, fishing, with your friends, family. There's usually a little bit of competition that uh, is involved. People like to bet quarters and dollars and other things, you know, first, biggest, most fish. Um, so hopefully I, what I'm gonna do here is um, help you out and, and put it into your head that catching a big bass isn't about luck and there's a lot of things you can do to put the odds in your favor. And uh, one of those things is obviously, um, turn the page here, know the difference of between bass, so um, whether it's a smallmouth or a largemouth bass, uh, I, I enjoy catching both. I, I like largemouth more. 
Um, but the trick to catching big fish is shallow water. And, you know, when I go fishing, um, I, my, my friend Michael, he's in the audience here. I don't know where he moved to. Um, I took him, where is he? Hey, he's over here in the corner. I took him fishing this summer, and um, we spent a lot of time fishing right in front of a lot of people's cottages, under their docks. Um, and cottagers will come down and ask you and quiz you and talk to you a little bit and ask you what you're fishing for, and you tell them bass, and they go, oh, yeah, I got to go out in the middle of the lake. Get out there in the middle of the lake. There's no fish here. But all 18 of those big bass um, that I caught in these tournaments and, and won all sorts of money for and stuff like that, all came in less than four feet of water. I mean, I mean, every big bass that I think I've ever caught that was worth bragging about came in, in less than four feet of water, whether it was a largemouth or a, a smallmouth bass. And uh, the reason is that, you know, bass are uh, an apex predator. And um, when they're shallow, that means they're active. If they're deep, they're usually being affected by cold fronts or barometric pressure and all that wizardry that goes into fishing that nobody can figure out, but we all have a theory on. Um, but by going shallow in that f four feet of water and less, everybody in this room is now fishing in the right area to catch big bass. Don't worry about 10 feet or points or rocks, shoals or drop-offs or anything. Just as long as you can see bottom, you're probably in the right area to hook a, hook a big bass. Because a big bass... Um, does two things when it's feeding. It likes to ambush, so it needs things to hide near, beside, under, blend in with, all those wonderful things. <coughs> and it needs uh, something to eat. And a bass will eat anything it can put in its mouth, whether it's a frog, a mouse, a chipmunk, a minnow, uh, a crayfish. And all those little things thrive in shallow water because there's weed growth, light penetration, sun, shade, uh, man-made structure, all those wonderful things. Um, so you definitely, uh, now that we're all fishing in the same depth, we know where we're looking for big bass. Um, what are we going to look for when we find that so-called shallow water? So if you're fishing for smallmouth, uh, rock shoals where they meet the shore or a sandbar, um, anything, um, anything a smallmouth can sort of use to um, blend in with, is, is structured to a smallmouth bass. Even if it's a different color, in a, like a black spot on a sandbar, a smallmouth will sit on top of a black spot on a sandbar and it'll actually, like a chameleon, match its colors to that black spot and now it's ready to ambush. Uh, largemouth, on the other hand, like um, overhead cover and weeds, things that they can disappear um, into as, as far as structure goes. Lily pads, you can see in some of these pictures, there's uh, a dock, there's some fallen trees in the water. All those things create shade or, or a transition area where a, a bass can hide. So the more stuff in that shallow water, whether it's a dock or a rock or a weed or a tree or um, a shade from a tree that's got the sun behind it, those are all great places to start looking. And eventually you're going to cast. So here's my fantastic little green and red and smallmouth, largemouth map. Um, this is a typical sort of Canadian Ontario lake. A lot of deep water, a lot of shallow water. Um, all these great looking little areas you, you have here. I think I actually have a laser here. Ooh. Don't mind my shaky hand. That's a long... Look at that. Can you imagine I can actually hit anything when I go hunting? <laughs> I'm officially old. It's a downward spiral from here. This seminar is over. <laughs> um, anyway, so the green, the green is for largemouth. The red is for smallmouth. And um, if you want to put the back, let's get back to the shallow water thing. Um, let's go with smallmouth, the red arrows. So this is a bay. This is actually a bay on Lake of the Woods. I like to fish on Lake of the Woods. And uh, it's got bass pretty much everywhere, so it's hard to not find bass. Well, this is a great lake to go to bass fishing if you're looking to catch a big one because there's so much shallow structure there that the odds are you're going to eventually run into one somewhere. But uh, these red arrows are all pointing to very shallow spots on the map, whether it's uh, a two-foot rock hump, um, a point that comes out of a shallow bay, um, 
what else is there? There's probably a sandbar in this, uh, in this somewhere. Yeah, there's, um, whoops. Where's that little spot button? So here's a good area back in here. Um, anywhere where shallow water meets deep water and there's something there, whether it's a rock, a tree, um, smallmouth will move up onto it or around it to feed. So rocks, sand, uh, we talked about those, but for largemouth, if you want to catch a really big largemouth, you've got to really dig deep and, and look at a map and look at the lake you're fishing on and think, uh, where, where's that big largemouth going to be? Yeah, he's going to be shallow, but if you look on this map, there's little areas of, of marsh, swamps, uh, that all would be good bass, um, largemouth bass water. And when I look at a map, when I first look at a map on any lake, even if I've never fished it before, the first thing I look for is that blue, blue water you see on the map, not white water. Um, the more blue water with marsh in it, the better off you're going to be. But places to go, don't just go to the first uh, bay that looks bassy and, and fish in it. Go to the back. I always go to the very back. And like I said, if, it's, if you're fishing smallmouth, go to where that shallow water starts and work your way out to the point. Don't just start on a point and fish. Because um, a lot of times fish will be up on the backs or in the very backs of these areas um, where most of us don't go. You know, you make a few casts at the front or the tip or the point or wherever you, you find there and then you leave. You have to get right to the backs of these places because uh, um, big bass are usually solitary and uh, they don't want to be dealing with everybody else's problems and they, are, uh, they like to isolate themselves. So by going into the back little nick corners and areas like that, you're going to find uh, where big bass hide. Now, I don't have, does everybody know what a bait cast reel is and a spinning reel is? Do I need to spend much time on this? I don't think so, right? Spinning reel, I like to use spinning uh, gear to catch smallmouth and bait cast gear to, uh, to fish for largemouth. Um, simply because largemouth are usually in uh, heavier cover and you need heavier gear to get them out. There's a, a spinning rod and a bait cast rod. Bait cast rods have a little trigger on them. I can, I'll pick it up here and use it for a minute. Line choices. A lot of people say, oh, what kind of line am I going to need to use? Do I need to use 30-pound monofilament, or is fluorocarbon worthwhile? Um, what about that new braided fancy super line like you'll see here on the, oops, on, the, uh, on the left? It looks like, that doesn't even look like fishing line, does it? But what that is, is that's a sort of a microscopic look at what braided line is. And um, most, most fishermen, especially if you're looking to catch big fish, uh, have switched to braided line because of its strength. Um, that, that suffix 832 line is kind of what I got on here, but um, the strength of, of braided line is almost like kite string, and it's, it looks like overkill, but what it gives you is uh, there's no stretch in it, it's sensitive, you can feel bites, and uh, it's 65-pound test, so people say, wow, you're going to catch a 65-pound bass? What do you need that line for? Well, it's not so much for the bass. It's for what you're pulling it out of and uh, where you're putting your lures. It can take a lot of abuse. So this is 65-pound braided line, and it's got the same diameter as 17-pound uh, monofilament. So there isn't much chance that any fish you catch is going to break your line or, or get off. And... Um, you can, put the, you can put this line and drag it over rocks and through trees and snag it on stuff, and you don't have to worry about it getting nicked and breaking when you set the hook. So um, if you're going largemouth bass fishing, I'm going to suggest you put braided line on your um, reel for that purpose only. And then the same with smallmouth, though, actually. Now, a lot of anglers with uh, zebra mussels, we all talk, you've probably had workshops in the past on invasive species and that, and zebra mussels are a problem. And um, they nick your line and, and cut your line. So what a lot of anglers are doing now is using braided line. I've got braided line on this spinning rod. And then they're tying a fluorocarbon leader, which is um, a very abrasion-resistant, um, strong... It's si similar to monofilament line. Tying a leader on, you know, a 36, 18, 24-inch leaders so that uh, now they have the sensitivity and strength of that braided line, but they've also got the invisible leader of a fairly strong material. And the reason we don't use 
spools of fluorocarbon because it's not, it's, it's not uh, cost effective and it, and it can break. So after we're done, if you want to pick my brain about line and stuff like that, you can do it. But I want to get back into uh, catching fish. Okay, largemouth. What's the most popular largemouth bass lures? I don't know, spinnerbait. A uh, gentleman was talking about jitterbugs earlier. Um, everybody remember the jitterbug or the crazy crawlers and all those wacky lures you threw out there and they walked and wobbled and did st stupid things on the water to try and get a fish's attention. Well, how many people just cast a lure out and reel it in and hope the fish is going to bite it? A lot of people do that still. A lot of people don't understand that it's the angler's um, skill level that is going to dictate what a lure does. If you just throw a lure out and let it sit or reel it straight back to the boat, your chances of catching that fish of a lifetime aren't very good. You actually have to impart action into lures. Um, in, there's a flipping jig. Everybody knows what a flipping jig is in here. Is anybody ever, does anybody not know what a flipping jig is? No. Flipping jig is probably one of the best big largemouth bass lures uh, there is because it's small, it's compact. Um, I'm going to say uh, uh, probably 80% of the big largemouth I've ever caught came on a flipping jig and it's a small little compact bait. You can put a um, pork trailer, a plastic crayfish trailer, all sorts of different little things on the back of it. My rod's longer than I thought. And uh, you can pinpoint cast it into little small areas where you think bass are. And that's the thing, if you just cast out into the lily pads and reel your lure in five or six times and say, oh, there's, there's no fish in there. Well, I guess I'll go over here and I'll cast over here. You might never catch a big bass. You have to look at those areas I showed you where the dock is and the lily pads are, and then you have to think. It's like this is where the hunting part of it comes in. You have to think, okay, if I was a, a fish, where would I hide? You know, would I just be sitting out in the open? Maybe I'm See this round table and there's a square table meat here? Maybe he's hiding right where they meet in the corner. You have to get your lure in there and let it sink so that if there is a fish there is a chance to see it. And then jiggle it, wiggle it, do impart action into it. And then when you're satisfied there's no fish there, reel it in and try again. Wake up. <laughs> <laughs> you're never going to catch a big bass if you're doing that in the boat. <coughs> <laughs> Um, but what I'm saying is, it, don't, ca don't go out casting, reeling, and hoping a bass bites. You have to go look for them. You have to find them. And the only way you're going to do that is by picking some of these lures that I'm showing you here and going to some of these areas I'm talking about and experimenting and actually go to where you think that fish might be. Maybe he's hiding behind Johnny Kerr there. I don't know if there's a fish safe around John Kerr, though. Um, this whole room might have one bass in it. And if you make five casts and leave, you're not going to be the person that catches that fish. You've got to tear it apart. You've got to get your lure, experiment, pick up different baits, use different retrieves, and try and dig those fish out of there. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've pulled up to a spot. Um, <clears throat> I need some water. I've, I've pulled up to a spot and another fisherman had just left or was, was fishing nearby and they were complaining that the fishing's no good or they haven't caught anything. And then you pull out a five or six pound bass and they're, they're blown away. And um, I was talking about fishing with Michael earlier. Um, dock fishing. I, my favorite place to catch big largemouth bass is under docks and a flipping jig's a good choice. But lately, um, I don't know if it's because of fishing pressure or fish getting smarter. I don't know what it is. Bass aren't usually as uh, cooperative as, uh, as they used to be and you have to actually get further back into where they hide and live. And, and like I said, if they're under a tree or a dock or an overhanging piece of structure, just throwing a lure near it and retrieving it or a lure near it and letting it sit doesn't always work. In the old days, bass used to just come darting out and eat whatever you threw in there and uh, it was game on. But now it seems you've got to get uh, a little more finesse um, into your presentations and go where they are. I don't have anything I can really cast under here, but um, casting under structure has always been a challenge and skipping. I've, everybody heard of skipping? 
not with a skipping rope or um, skipping school like I used to do. Skipping a bait along the surface to get underneath something is now, uh, I mean, I've, I've seen bass that I've, I can only dream of catching come out from underneath stuff that I'm skipping lures to. And uh, a lot of guys are using spinning gear again with braid because it's so strong, and you're actually skipping a bait low along the surface of the water to get it underneath something. And now, you know, if the dock's 50 feet long or if there's a swim platform or a big willow tree hanging over, you can skip a lure off the surface and get it under. They're inventing new lures all the time that um, work, work better for that presentation. But to get big fish out of stuff, I'll, I'll skip a bait 10 times till I get it to that place I want at the back of a dock or um, at the, uh, uh, under a fallen tree or whatever it might be to, uh, to it trick it into biting. And a lot of times you have to downsize. Like this bait here is, I don't know, it's a four inch or something. Uh, but a lot of guys will downsize to a bait a, an inch and a half long, and it's hard to skip. But that bass could be sitting there and see your lure 15 times and not bite it. It's the 16th cast that he's going to bite on. So by being determined and learning new techniques and tricks and ways to, to get your lure um, to these fish, you're going to catch bigger bass. I think uh, Steve Bates, he's sitting right here in front of me. We were, we were in a tournament. We fished some tournaments years ago together, and we, uh, we were going along, and I said, oh, there's fish came out from under a, a parked boat and looked at my lure and swam back under. It wasn't giant, but we needed it because we were in a tournament. We needed this one fish to bite. And I'd rather fish for a, a fish I know is there than a fish that I don't, you know, could be anywhere else in the lake. So what we did is we were messing around, and this was years ago before anybody was skipping lures and twitching and doing all these drop shotting and fancy stuff. I said, how am I going to get my lure under that boat? And he, Steve was kind of getting mad at me because I was wasting a lot of time. And so I said, I don't know, let, let me try this. I've done this a couple times and it's kind of worked. So I sunk my lure, let it sort of sink down slowly beside me. And I put the trolling motor backwards and I turned the trolling motor on and hit the pedal and the current from the trolling motor pushed my lure up under this boat. It took like forever. Like I'm pulling off line and my lure's sort of going under the boat and he's, he's kind of doing this at the front of the boat. Holy, so you really think this is going to... And the next thing you know, I see my line jerk, whack, I set the hook, I catch this fish because I got my lure into where that fish was. Fish aren't always going to come out and hit your bait. You got to get your bait into where they are. So um, I'll talk a little bit more about skipping and twitching and ballerinas and whatever else I'm going to talk about. But let's go to smallmouth. Smallmouth... Smallmouth uh, are, uh, are an interesting fish. On the best days, they'll hit anything that's, that's in the water. How many people here like catching smallmouth bass on top water? Everybody, everybody loves catching bass on top water, especially smallies. They go, they go hairy carry for it, right? But a lot of smallmouth will just follow a bait. You don't even know they're there. You know, unless you have polarized glasses on or you're in clear water, you don't even know that fish is behind your lure. It's kind of like a shark, right? Um, with smallmouth, yeah, smaller baits, um, faster, flashy baits uh, seem to work good. And in this picture, you're going to see I've got, there's an X-Wrap. Has everybody used an X-Wrap? They, they came out with the, Rapala came out with the X-Wrap, I don't know how many years ago. And it's the extreme action slash bait, like pretty aggressive sounding thing. But a slash bait is uh, just basically a minnow bait that was altered so that when you, you don't just cast it or troll it behind your boat and let it swim along. You cast it out and you jerk your rod tip. Or you, if you're trolling, you pull your rod tip and the bait reacts by shooting off to one side and then to the other side. So you're imparting that action into the, the bait by, by twitching it, giving it a quick jerk, those sorts of things. Um, and the pause. How many people catch fish on a pause? Yeah, I mean... When, when they first started writing articles, you'd read it and it would say, oh, the cadence and this and that, and twitch, twitch, pause, and pause, pause, twitch. Well, I don't know how to pause three times. So it's just a long pause. But, I mean, by pausing, by, by pausing your bait, um, you're going to get a lot of strikes from following fish. And musky fishermen probably um, 
can attest to that most. A lot of big muskies uh, are caught on, um, you know, a figure eight beside the boat, and then you just let your bait uh, dead fall. Or when you cast out and it's sitting there. How many people have caught a big bass pulling a backlash out of their reel? <laughs> yeah, I've I, I admit it. I mean, I've probably caught just as many as pulling backlashes than I have not pulling backlashes. But, and what that is is because that fish has had a chance to, to now investigate what that splash was or noise was or what, whatever it was that attracted it to your lure. And now it's sitting there not doing anything and the fish says, I'm going to eat this. Well, and then you actually just reel over that backlash and set the hook and, and the, you're on for a fight. But smallmouth are notorious for being a curious fish. And um, you need lots of different, like a spinnerbait. You see a spinnerbait up here on the right. That's like one of the easiest ways to catch smallmouth when they're aggressive. Um, but a search lure like an x wrap or even a topwater bait are great for when you're smallmouth fishing. If you're casting and casting, a lot of times you'll see that fish. It, it'll come and turn or it'll swirl. You see that big boil on the surface. You think, oh, wow, there was a giant bass over there. He didn't bite. Oh, well, I go somewhere else and try and catch another one. That's the biggest mistake um, fishermen make is when they get a hit or miss a, a fish that was that five, six, seven pound fish of a lifetime, is they just leave or they say, oh, well, I guess I'm not going to get another chance at him. That's when a, a, a good fisherman will go back and figure out how to catch that fish. And like a tube jig uh, down here in the bottom right of the screen, you'll see there's a tube. There's a, a little crayfish imitating bait, drop shotting. Has anybody tried drop shotting? Everybody know what drop shotting is? It was a, it was a halibut fishing um, technique to keep crabs off of halibut baits. And they use a big weight at the bottom of a, of a line with a hook above it to catch halibut. And they, it's, it was invented to keep crabs from stealing the bait. Well, drop shotting now is taken over the bass fishing world. And it's just a little small lead weight with a tiny little trout mosquito hook up there and when you get those fish that swirl on your bait or follow your bait and you think oh I'm never going to catch that fish that's when a tube jig or a drop shot or a little crayfish um, imit imitating bait on a, on a light jig head it's, it's called a follow-up cast and you just basically follow right to where that fish was spotted or it splashed or swirled and you throw that bait in there and I'm going to say I don't know a high percentage, not 90% uh, of the time, but a high percentage of the time, you're going to actually catch that fish now. And, and tournament fishermen mastered that sort of uh, the art of catching the, the fish that didn't bite or, or missed your lure. Um, and I still see it today. I still see fishermen, you know, professional fishermen say, ah, well, that fish wasn't going to bite. I'm just going to go look for another one. Well, when you know there's one there, I'm going to suggest don't ever leave because there's no sense of leaving a fish you know is aggressive and ready to strike a lure to go and look for a fish that you don't even know is there. So exhaust your resources. Like, yeah, we have 13, 14, 500 rods in the boat. And once that rod locker's open, look out, right? Because you're going to go through tackle boxes and hooks and weights and plastics and stuff's going to be flying in the air until you actually catch the fish. And you will catch that fish if you're determined enough. Um, and uh, I think I've proven that, you know, I've, I've failed probably more than I've succeeded at catching those, those big fish, but you're never going to be able to have that wall hanger or that picture of that six pound fish or even get that fish on unless you start uh, imparting some of these, these sort of things I'm talking about here. And the lure isn't as important as the, the mindset. If you're confident and if you've got uh, a tackle box full of stuff to throw, you're going to you're going to learn to catch these fish. Um, and, and finding them again is uh, half the battle. So you, we know where to look, shallow water, structure, all those wonderful things. There should be bass in the lake, hopefully you're fishing. <laughs> and uh, uh, what next? So now you just, like I said, we talked about casting. There's, there's, there's lingo that goes with bass fishing. I mean, I think more than any other um, style of fishing, Bass fishing guys have their own language, and if you overheard a couple of guys talking about bass fishing, you, you might think they're, <laughs> they're not right, but there's flipping, pitching, twitching, jerking, popping, punching, drop shotting, dragging, dead sticking, towing. I mean, all those things go through 
fishermen's, bass fishermen's minds when they're out there. Um, like a flip, I was doing some flipping earlier, and, and flipping is probably the, the oldest, you know, bass master 1986 technique that revolutionized fishing um, there is, and it was a simple way to get um, a lure in a precise spot, like you wanted to, sorry, yeah, I didn't mean to hit your glass, but you need to get that lure in a precise spot, so flipping was sort of the old, you know, you, you'd see that back in the old days, the guys swinging and waiting and, and hoping, and then they would drop it in. Um, and th it's evolved to pitching now where you don't even use your hand and line. Um, and you can, you can get that bait in uh, anywhere you want that thing. So flipping has uh, become a staple in bass fishing. Skipping, I showed you skipping. Twitching with jerk baits. All those things you should be doing out there. Um, and if you're not, if you're just casting and reeling the lure back to the boat, you're, you're losing the you're going to lose the game. So learn some of the lingo if you hear it or if you go into a bait shop or a, or a Canadian Tire Pro Shop and talk to the guys, pick up the lures and, uh, and ask them, hey, you know, what, what's a good lure for dead sticking? What's a good bait to Carolina rig? What is a Carolina rig? How, what is a dead stick, you know? Someone's going to tell you this. And I mean, I can't, dis I can't demonstrate up here. If you watch the show, the odd episode, I might do some of that stuff when I'm bass fishing. But, uh, you know, g Google it, read about it. Um, all those things come in handy and uh, are necessary if you want to catch that uh, big bass of a lifetime. There, see? That's the bass I caught last week. I was down in Texas. But, you know, it's, it's funny. It's funny. I'm going to kind of just ramble on now. Um, uh, someone called a bass a stump carp earlier. <laughs> you said you were talking about stump carp. Um, what? Green carp. Green carp, yeah. Well, they're, you know what? I mean, there's a reason bass are uh, uh, young and old. Uh, there was a story I heard earlier about a, a jitterbug that's broken in half, and it's on a wall with the, the line attached to it, and it was uh, someone's father's um, world record bass that, probably would have uh, made him famous. We all think of the, the fame and fortune that comes with catching a big fish, and no other fish captivates us, I think, like that than a bass. That's why there's the, the FLW Tour and the Bass Masters and walls and racks and companies that have 650,000 different color patterns of a plastic thing about that big that if they don't, if they don't have the right one, we're not going to catch anything. It's, uh, it's sort of a sick, twisted addiction um, you get when you uh, get hooked on bass fishing. And, and for me, um, bass fishing is the reason I'm standing here today. Um, I got hooked on it at a young age and uh, learned how to catch big ones, and it's been sort of a, a passion of mine uh, throughout my life. But I've been able to take the, the, the tricks and tips and the hunting skills that I've used for whether I'm uh, hunting snowshoe hare or, or deer or turkey or if I'm casting for pike or musk, all those little things that you learn when you're in the field, when you're, when you're hunting and fishing, come in so handy um, in bass fishing, especially because you actually have to go hunting if you want to catch a big one. You, you might catch one by accident in your life or you might get one off the dock having a beer um, with, the, with the, the rod in a holder and talking to your friends, but if you want to go out and consistently catch um, big bass, you got to do those little things that I talked about. Find some shallow water, find some productive structure, whether it's lily pads or weeds or rocks and docks, and you have to master all those uh, techniques and, and it have dogged determination uh, because they're not going to come to you, you got to go to them. So what I'll probably do now is uh, stop yammering and if uh, anybody wants to throw a question my way, you can feel free to do that. Or if there's no questions, I'll just come down and we'll, I'll mingle with you guys and walk around and you can tell me about uh, the big one that got away or uh, quiz me on how maybe to catch that big one that you know lives somewhere on your lake, that little stump or shoal or 
uh, rock pile or whatever it might be, and uh, hopefully I can help you, uh, help you hook that fish of a lifetime. All right? Oh, yes and no. Rod, uh, Leslie, Leslie asked me if, if rod length uh, matters. When, it, when you're, if you're going to go out and buy one fishing rod, let's say for bass, and it's a bait caster, um, you know, a seven foot sort of medium heavy action rod is probably good all around, but you're asking the wrong guy for that because there's a, a length and a, a weight and a um, action for every lure out there. Um, but ultimately, like this here, this here is probably the, I have a flipping stick in my hand 80% of the time when I'm bass fishing, and it's a seven and a half foot telescopic rod. Um, and the reason for the length isn't so much for leverage or for, for anything other than it's a close range uh, belly to belly sort of warfare when you're bass fishing. So the closer I can get, if you're that big bass, the closer I can get to you without my boat interfering in your, your area, the better off I am. So like I can almost touch you with my fishing rod. Now an eight or a nine foot rod is a little too much to handle and gets awkward, but that seven and a half foot rod is uh, ideal for, you can get it up high in the air, and if you need to get above something, under something, around something, and it's a manageable rod length. So yeah, rod length is, is fairly important depending on what you're fishing for, but uh, with, with, with bass, yeah, sort of the longer seven, eight foot rods, the better, better off you are, and you can have that <coughs> leverage. If I was trying to flip a lure with a rod that was four feet long, I would lose accuracy. So rod length is, uh, is very important, yeah. Anyone else? Yeah, Dan Polsky, Sturgeon Falls. Um, for pike, would your advice or your scenario be similar to that for um, if you're fishing pike? Yeah, well, actually, um, tomorrow's show, um, I'm fishing in Frenchman's Bay in Pickering with uh, this rod, and I'm flipping for pike. So I've got a big swim bait, you know, a pike-style bait, and I'm flipping weed pockets and letting it sink in for pike. So yeah. Um, it, it, pike, it's seasonal, obviously. You know, in the midsummer, you're not going to get very many big pike um, in the shallows. But, you know, I guided at a lodge in, in northern Ontario for a couple of years, and all the big, you know, the, the American guests would come up and say they want to catch a 40-inch pike. Well, right to the back, creek mouths, swamps, um, areas where they spawn. And, uh, yeah, the same method, the same things apply. So I would, uh, you know, a lot, of, a lot of what you do with bass fishing applies to, to uh, pike and muskie fishing as well. Thank you. Hi, Mike. I'm Fred Gebert from Own Sound. Um, don't know if it applies for tournament fishing or not, but uh, just uh, your opinion or comments on use of live bait, like leech, uh, soft-shell crayfish, uh, minnows, frogs, that kind of thing for bass fishing? Yeah, well, you know what? Um, Smallmouth bass more than largemouth bass. I mean, a leech, I've been embarrassed um, during some bass tournaments on Lake Simcoe and, and Lake Erie by anglers using live bait, you know. I, from you to me away, I've got a tackle box full of all the latest, greatest, fancy gadgets, and there's some anglers beside me with a bucket of leeches catching four-pounder after four-pounder, yeah, and I can't yeah. put one in the boat. So it does have its advantages. Yes, that's, uh, uh, you know, live bait does have its advantages, but it also has disadvantages. I mean, it's, uh, you got to keep it alive and yeah. rehook your bait and all those wonderful things. Um, but if you're, uh, if you're into that, uh, what I was kind of talking about, going out and, and getting to where the bass are, artificial baits are far superior only because, you, you know, you try and flip a crayfish on a jig into somewhere like that and it skips and the crayfish goes one way and your hook sinks. Now you've got a hook in the water with no bait on it. So... Yeah. Um, you know, a live bait does work, and you can catch lots of fish on it, but um, if you want that aggressive, isolated, big bass, um, and you've got to make him bite, you know, he, he could come over, and a big five, six-pound bass could come over and be sitting there looking at your leech or your minnow, and he ain't going to eat it if it doesn't move the right way. And that's when it comes back to you. You've got to move that bait the right way. And the baits I've showed you, some of the new stuff on the market uh, outperforms live bait, so... Yeah. Um, I would, uh, and you can 
get better hooks on artificial lures than okay, you can. Okay, interesting. Like Thanks. Okay. Yeah. Hey, Mike. Bill Blackwell. How are you, Bill? <laughs> I'm good, Mike. I want to just sort of test your knowledge in different ways. As you and I have talked several times about where I do go fishing, so you know obviously I'm a trout person. That's right. And, and as I tease people, I say I only fish for bass when I need more worms for trout. <laughs> 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 Dang. <laughs> anyway, because I do live up in the trout waters area where we do go fishing and all that, uh, there were no bass in the lakes, and unfortunately, some people have transported bass, put them into lakes, and now uh, one of these lakes in particular has overflowed, and we now have bass in the river system with trout. So from your knowledge of fishing, how much will that impact on the trout fishery? You speckles, know, speckles, and lakers in particular. Um, I, I, I mean, I'm not a biologist by any stretch, but I have had the opportunity, to, I mean, from Algonquin Park to British Columbia to um, New Brunswick, fish in waters where bass have become invasive, so to speak, and um, the effects, I, mean, I, I personally didn't notice the effects, um, you know, whether it was with brown trout or speckled trout. I mean, Opiango is probably a good example. Um, there's still great lake trout fishing in Opiango, and they're past, I, I think probably with specks, it's, it's a bit of a, it might have a negative impact, but it, 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 the impact is uh, only as negative as you want it to be. Um, it's still, I mean, it's there. It's a fish that exists now. You can't, you're not going to make it go away, so I would embrace it and uh, fish for them. Uh, encourage people to fish for them, and that way it, you, you can uh, probably bring the population back into balance and um, still enjoy some good speckled trout fishing, right? But if you go up there and you say, oh, the bass wrecked everything, I'm never going back, you're not, you know, you're, you're only effect negatively affecting yourself. So I would go back, spend a day bass fishing. I mean, smallmouth bass are good to eat. I, would, I don't eat largemouth bass personally, but um, I've, smallmouth bass are good to eat. So yeah. go up there and catch a few and eat them and get some revenge for those speckled trout. And let the speckled trout go, though. So. <laughs> I actually, a couple of years ago, when you were going to come up and maybe do a shoot, shoot a bear hunt up there, I did take the Mexican friend that I did have, and we went out and we caught a stringer of three-pound smallies, and I mean a stringer full, within about half an hour. And uh, they, they just love them and all that. So it's, uh, and this is just trolling with a spinner with a worm. So yeah, it, it was, it's it's good, but you know it's just sad to see that yeah, but you got it, invasive now. Unfortunately, it you, you can't do anything about it. So enjoy them, catch them, and do your part, right? Thanks, Mike. Uh, Mike uh, Frank Weck from Ajax. Uh, why are the bass in, for example, southern U.S. have a tendency to be larger than the ones we have here? Is yeah, that well, just climate or no? Well, they're a different strain. Um, like the Florida strain largemouth bass isn't uh, we, isn't the same breed of bass we have. Oh, okay, so, so the, they are a different They animal. are a different breed, oh, yeah. Okay. They won't survive in, like a peacock bass, uh, a Florida strain largemouth won't survive, I think, in water temperatures th that are below, uh, you know, 58 degrees or something for any extended period. So they wouldn't survive up here in our climate. That's why the Georgia, Texas, uh, Florida, all the southern <coughs> states have California, uh, Florida strain. And w that's, w you know, when you see you catch a six pound bass, it's a pretty big bass. But if you go to the southern United States, yeah. they they, they scoff at six pound bass, right? They're looking for 18 pound largemouth bass, right. but they're not the same fish. Okay, and, and here then in Southern Ontario, what time of year is the best time to go for smallies? It's, it's I mean, in Southern Ontario, the best time to go for smallies, that's a, that's a good one. I mean, early in the season, I mean, I've shot shows uh, and fish tournaments the week of opening and it can be very difficult bass right. fishing because they're transitioning from the guarding beds and spawning to going where they, they set up for the summer. So I wouldn't say early season. Um, late fall late okay. fall is probably the best time of year to, act, to, to be able to access big smallmouth bass because they're very predictable. They're usually, you know, once you get to a, a, a turnover and the lake temperatures drop, they pile up on deep water structure and um, on, on nice days, you can move up to the shallow edges of that and uh, catch, like, literally six-pounder after six-pounder. So uh, late fall, late fall for, for big smallies, for sure. But I've always had trouble getting them in the, in the shallow water late in the fall. 
Well, but that's what I'm saying. If you pick your day, okay. right? If you pick your day, they pile up and then they're like lake trout in the fall. Lake trout come up shallow to spawn, but um, what happens is if you get that nice day and it's, it'd be, you go across a rock flat in the fall, it, it looks like an ant farm down there with giant smallmouth bass swimming around because they're taking advantage of that, that, uh, that warm spell or, or whatever it might be, and uh, it's a free-for-all. So to speak. Anybody else? No? Perfect. Well, that's uh, about all I got for you. But uh, like I said, if there's something you don't want to come out in public and ask or you might be embarrassed, feel free to just come over and tap me on the shoulder and ask me. All right? Thank you.